Hi, this is Steve Warona, and you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Before I introduce today's speakers, here's a brief orientation to the Adobe Connect interface we're using. Your browser right now is showing the title slide for today's talk. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a box labeled Questions and Comments, where you can read and type messages. Now, there's a tab labeled Everyone at the bottom of that box, and that's the tab you'll use for all of your general messages, including questions and comments for our speakers. We'll be breaking for questions several times during the presentation, so please do not hold your questions to the end. You can also send direct messages to a specific person by hovering your cursor over a name in the attendee list. And one of those names is Technical Help, and that's the place to go if you run into technical problems. We're also monitoring Twitter for your questions and comments. Use the hashtag NCCPSWebinar. If you missed part of today's conversation, or if you want to see some or all of it again, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be available shortly after the webinar on the NCCPS Webinars webpage. And watch your email for a link to a brief evaluation survey requesting your reactions and comments on today's presentation. Please take a minute to respond to that survey when the link arrives. We do appreciate your feedback. And now for our presentation. Today we're welcoming four exceptional speakers. We'll hear first from Kim Richmond, Director of the National Center for Campus Public Safety, to give us an update on the Center. Our second speaker will be Thomas R. Tremblay, former Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Public Safety, and now a national and international advisor and trainer for police, prosecutors, advocates, higher education, the military, and the private sector. Tom will be discussing trauma-informed sexual assault investigation. After Tom, we'll hear from Dr. Marisa Rendazzo, speaking on behavioral threat assessment. Dr. Rendazzo served for 10 years with the U.S. Secret Service and is an international expert on threat assessment, targeted violence, and violence prevention. Our final speaker will be Stephen J. Healy, managing partner and co-founder of Margolis Healy, which is the National Center's host organization. Stephen formerly served as Director of Public Safety at Princeton, Chief of Police at Wellesley, and Operations Director for the Department of Public Safety at Syracuse. He's a nationally recognized expert on campus public safety, Title IX, and the Clery Act, and his topic today is fair and impartial policing. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's begin. Kim, you have the floor. And I'm sorry, Kim, we've got the wrong slides there, so let's get your slides where they should be. And... <laughs> Apologies. Sorry, Kim, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and again, welcome to the first webinar in our Campus Public Safety online series. I will provide a brief overview of the National Center for Campus Public Safety for those who may not be familiar with the work of the National Center, and an update for where we are today. The National Center is funded under the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. Through a competitive bid process, Margolis Healy was awarded funding to establish the National Center. And our offices opened in May 2014 in Burlington, Vermont. In addition to myself, we hired two research associates and a training and technical assistance coordinator who began last July. The National Center's advisory board is made up of representatives from the International Association of Emergency Managers, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, College and University Section, the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators, the Virginia Tech Victim Family Outreach Foundation, and the Cleary Center for Security on Campus. The primary responsibilities for the National Center are to identify and prioritize the needs of the field and to develop comprehensive responses to those needs, including connecting federal and non-federal resources to practitioners doing the work, and to connect campus safety professionals with each other and with federal agencies on issues around campus public safety, and then to highlight and promote best and innovative practices to address specific campus safety challenges. We are purposeful as we develop resources to be inclusive of all types of campuses, public, private, two-year, four-year, historically black colleges and universities, and tribal, as well as considering the needs of both sworn and non-sworn campus safety officials. We will continue to coordinate training and technical assistance as needs are identified, and we're working to establish a comprehensive national directory, which will be a national contact list of campus safety and emergency management officials that will be used by those officials to connect with each other. 
We will ask those professionals to establish a profile and identify areas of specific expertise or experience they are willing to share with others. We also maintain a document repository in our website library. There are a multitude of campus safety resources available on our website at www.nccpsafety.org. In addition to the library, we also have a list with links to affiliate organizations and a calendar of training or conference events relevant to campus public safety and emergency managers. And it's easily searchable by area of interest. The website also provides the opportunities to submit your own campus safety event to our staff for possible inclusion on the event's calendar. As we continue, our campus public safety online webinars will be archived on the website. And also, you can con there will be contact information for all the NCCPS staff. You can also keep updated with news and relevant information by following us on Facebook and Twitter. On the home page of our website, there is a tab in the upper left corner to join our mailing list and select the communication you would like to receive from NCCPS. One option of communication is to receive our weekly snapshot. Our research associates target two topic areas every week to highlight and provide specific resources for. Archived snapshots are also available on our website under the News tab. Additional initiatives by the NCCPS are we are working on partnering with professional associations to host a series of presidential roundtable discussions on various campus safety related topics. We're in the early stages of development of a variety of professional educational opportunities for campus safety and emergency managers. We're also partnering with the University of Vermont to co-host this year's Legal Issues Conference to include a campus safety track. Some of the confirmed speakers are Peter Lake, Leslie Gomez, Allison Kiss, and Commander Lynn Hammer from the U.S. Naval Academy. Some of the campus safety related topic areas include fair and impartial policing, prevention programming strategies, and improving services to victims. The NCCPS will also host a focus group discussion for public safety professionals as an add-on to the conference, and that topic is yet to be determined. The conference will be held during peak foliage season in Burlington, Vermont, October 19th through the 21st. We also partnered with IACLEA, IACP, College and University Section, and the University of Wisconsin in August 2014 to hold a summit that brought together campus officials from around the United States to discuss unresolved issues around Title IX and other related legislation, including the Cleary Act and the Violence Against Women Act. Campus police administrators, deans of students, Title IX and Cleary compliance staff, and others meant to work toward better compliance, not only with the letter of the law, but far more important with the spirit of the law. Summit participants created a comprehensive list of issues and promising practices to consider. A follow-up summit was held at Georgia Tech in January, and both reports are available on our website. We have also partnered with the Cleary Center and IACLEA Regional Conferences to facilitate focus group discussions on the topic of reclaiming the spirit of the Cleary Act. We have conducted five focus groups around the country and have two additional focus groups scheduled. The purpose of these discussions is to identify significant challenges in the implementation of the Cleary Act and to draft recommendations that will advance efforts to reclaim the spirit of Cleary. These recommendations will spark further discussions with practitioners and subject matter experts and will inform future policy efforts. Some of the significant challenges identified from the focus groups have been issues around timely warnings, the intersection of Cleary and Title IX, campus security authority identification and training, crime definitions, and non-campus property, especially as it pertains to international locations. We also gained consensus from Cleary compliance officers regarding recommendations identified in the 2015 report produced by the Task Force on Federal Regulation of Higher Education. This report was the result of the work of a task force established by a bipartisan group of senators in partnership with the American Council on Education. This report, titled Recalibrating Regulation of Colleges and Universities, is available in the NCCPS online library. In addition to our pre-described focus areas, we were also assigned by the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault to develop a training curriculum for trauma-informed sexual assault investigations for campus officials involved in investigating and adjudicating sexual assaults. This training is primarily targeted to those civilian officials involved in cases on their campuses, 
However, public safety officials and law enforcement investigators are welcome to attend and have found value in the content of the course, as well as learning more about Title IX investigations. We worked with subject matter experts to develop draft curriculum that has been delivered through three pilot training sessions spread across the United States to include not only various geographic areas, but also various types of institutions to ensure their needs are included and they are involved in providing feedback for the pilot sessions. We are currently under development of an online component of this course and will deliver the course in this new format in our fourth pilot session scheduled in August. Future course delivery is being determined. The topic areas that are discussed in the training sessions are institutional obligations under Title IX Clery and Violence Against Women Act, rape myths and culture, the importance and strategies for partnerships and coordination, both on and off campus, language and communication relative to sexual assault investigations, including report writing, and most importantly, what does it mean to have a trauma-informed response, investigation, and adjudication? Tom Tremblay is one of our faculty members who assisted in curriculum development and has conducted related training models at our pilot courses. Following a brief question and answer on the National Center, Tom will talk about the importance of and strategies for a trauma-informed response. I will now open it up to questions about the National Center. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online. You just heard Kim Richman talk about the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Um, Kim, what's the best way to, for people to communicate with the National Center um, with uh, questions or, or resource needs? On our homepage, in the upper right corner, there's a contact button. You can email or call. Or if you'd like to connect with a specific team member, uh, under the About tab, under staff, it provides a direct phone number and email address to each member of our team. Now, you've mentioned that you have focus groups and you have roundtable discussions. Um, how can people participate in those? We welcome and encourage suggestions for topic areas for future focus groups and roundtable discussions. And if you would like to join those discussions, uh, again, just email or call with your uh, contact information. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, we'll be pausing a number of other times for questions and comments. Please um, type your questions and comments into the uh, box there. Uh, Steve, actually, Stephen Healy has had a question. Um, when will the trauma-informed program be available nationally? So the, the time frame for the continued delivery of the course is, has yet to be determined, but, but soon, um, as, as far as summer, fall, as, as early as the fall semester, we should be having those available. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Um, next, as Kim has mentioned, we have Tom Tremblay talking about trauma-informed sexual assault investigation. Tom, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, uh, 10 to 12 minutes talking a little bit about some of the, the uh, national efforts at trauma-informed response to sexual assault. Um, the, uh, I apologize. Um, so um, looking at the slide, uh, really having a, a national conversation about why has there been so much in influence? Why has there been so much concern around trauma-informed approaches? And uh, certainly, as Kim mentioned, this comes from a White House task force recommendation to create trauma-informed approaches uh, for higher education. And this really stems from victim and survivor activism and outrage. So in my 30 plus years in law enforcement, uh, never before have we seen the level of activism and outrage uh, from uh, victims and survivors of sexual assault. Um, this activism and outrage really uh, kind of stems from a few key points. So we've had the opportunity to talk to some of the survivors uh, around the country, and one of the biggest concerns uh, that has been voiced to us uh, from them is either a perceived or an actual failed first impression on the part of the campus or the police response. And uh, what we have come to know and understand in a trauma-informed approach is making sure that um, campus law enforcement and campus officials understand that that first impression really does matter. Um, that regardless of who the disclosure is made to, in the end, the first impression is of the institutional's ability to respond and making sure that 
all of those potential first responders, whether they be police, RAs, um, any anyone uh, um, in higher ed, that they they are understand trauma informed approaches. The other things that we heard a lot from the survivors was uh, I wasn't believed and I wasn't supported, and um, this again led to that concern about a failed first impression, as well as the victim blaming attitudes, beliefs, and comments that victims and survivors shared as part of their experience in reporting both the law enforcement and uh, in the administration of, 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 the, of the higher ed institution. Um, so there was a lot of concern around not being believed, not being supported, and, and being blamed. Also, while we know the majority of these cases uh, occur between um, uh, male offenders and, um, and female victims, there was also a determination of a lack of a culturally competent response for all victims, regardless. Um, so who do you serve on your campus, and uh, whether it be international students, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, that, that we have a, a culturally competent response uh, for all victims of sexual assault, uh, that is, of course, trauma-informed. Um, the, the next thing is, is really an understanding um, uh, that there has been a lack of training, uh, both in law enforcement, the criminal justice system, uh, and in higher education around um, supporting victims and survivors in a trauma-informed way. And so the lens has really changed, and we're, we're trying to really shift the way that we look at these cases. Um, no fault of law enforcement in the criminal justice system. Uh, the majority of us in law enforcement didn't receive this, this training uh, early on in our careers. And, and really, the, the change has occurred over the last uh, really five to six years as we begin to understand the science uh, behind trauma. So as we, as we look at understanding trauma, um, looking at the research that's been done, there are two leading um, individuals uh, nationally that I have relied heavily upon, and, and many of you have heard speak uh, around the neurobiology of trauma. That's Dr. David Lisak and Dr. Rebecca Campbell. Both have been uh, leaders in helping us understand the science behind trauma and then designing trauma-informed approaches based on that science. Um, so you're, you're hearing a lot about trauma-informed approaches. You're hearing a lot about trauma-informed victim interview. And I think you're beginning to hear a lot more about uh, the FETI, Forensic Experiential Trauma Interview. FETI is um, an interview strategy that is, in fact, the same as trauma-informed. Uh, and uh, perhaps you have heard Russell Strand, he's the chief of the United States Army Military Police School, talk about this specific uh, interview strategy, um, again, being taking a look at the science behind the neurobiology of trauma and then designing interview approaches for that. So uh, you will hear a lot about trauma-informed victim interviewing and forensic experimental, experiential trauma interview. They are essentially the same thing. Um, they really rely on the science of trauma uh, to help us understand how we can uh, have more successful approaches and, uh, and help identify uh, critical information that's part of the entire victim's experience uh, following uh, the trauma of the sexual assault. So understanding trauma and impact really kind of focuses on uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, that we have to understand that the science tells us that trauma physically changes our brain. Hormones and chemicals are released that influence perception, reaction, and memory and these, these have impacts on their victims both during the incident and uh, following the incident. Uh, and sometimes uh, that trauma can be um, lifelong. We also have to understand that traumatic memory is stored in the brain differently, very different from the way that we would store normal memories. Um, the traumatic memory is stored in the brain differently and influenced by um, the chemicals that are released during a traumatic event. Uh, so really, again, understanding the science and then designing approaches based on the science. And then the last thing that I always like to point out as we try to really understand trauma and impact is that we really don't control how the brain and the body responds to trauma. This is something that's uh, very difficult for law enforcement to understand. Um, 
quite honestly, uh, we, we don't understand the impacts of trauma on ourselves. And I think the, that our profession is beginning to do a better job understanding trauma. And as a result, we, have, we are beginning to now apply that same understanding uh, to victims of uh, sexual assault, uh, dating violence, stalking, and, and those types of crimes that victims often sustain trauma from. The impact of trauma on the victim, again, is part of understanding this, is really what we oftentimes see as counterintuitive behavior. And so when a victim sustains trauma, the, uh, the brain and the body respond, the chemicals influence perception, reaction, and memory, and victims ask themselves, I should have, would have, could have done this. Oftentimes, we the police or investigators or uh, Folks who, have, um, who are offering support to victims who are disclosing often wonder why the victim did this and why the victim didn't do that. Uh, so really getting away from um, trying to understand why they did or why they didn't do something, oftentimes survivors have explained to us uh, that that feels like blaming, like I should have done something to prevent this. Uh, so really getting away from um, not focusing on why the trauma caused this counterintuitive behavior, but really trying to understand it and accept it as part of that trauma-informed response. The other thing that we have to accept is that um, memory is fragmented, that um, victims really struggle to provide a chronological and sequence narrative. Unfortunately, the way that many of us were trained was to conduct an interview by asking, tell us what happened, tell us what happened next, tell us what happened after that. And what the science about trauma has informed us is that the memory is fragmented and trying to come up with a chronological narrative is really, uh, is really difficult for victims who have been through a traumatic event. So again, designing interview strategies um, that, that don't rely on a chronological narrative, but rather rely on more open-ended questions to provide a narrative of what the victim is able to tell us about their experience at that time. We also have to recognize that the impacts of trauma are often misinterpreted, and this, this is part of that victim blaming that we see. Uh, oftentimes, the impacts of trauma, this lack of ability to come up with a chronological narrative, uh, this fragmented memory, if we don't accept that as part of trauma, oftentimes it can look like uh, deception, um, and law enforcement uh, uh, prosecutors, uh, jurors, have looked at this counterintuitive behavior and said that doesn't seem like something that someone who has been through this would do. Uh, we have to put that aside and accept that um, there is going to be reactions that, that don't make sense. It's not going to make sense to us. And in fact, what we hear from survivors is it doesn't make sense to them. So the impacts of trauma are often misinterpreted, causing this victim-blaming concern and no justice as a part of this. Uh, offenders aren't held accountable, uh, victims and survivors walking away feeling like they weren't believed and supported, which, is, which has really caused this, this concern uh, and this recommendation to make sure that all of us that respond to victims and survivors of sexual assault uh, understand trauma and its impact. Understanding trauma and supporting victims uh, can assist in healing. Uh, I mentioned that trauma can oftentimes be lifelong. And um, this is a reality for many survivors that we hear. So um, the way that we respond, especially in the first disclosure, that first impression is so key in, in helping victims heal in the long run. We also have to recognize that delayed reporting, inability to recall the de those details and sequence of events is common as a result of trauma. And again, being trauma-informed, just simply accept these facts changing the thought process from taking a statement is an event that we really have to look at that this, this disclosure is a process and not an event. We have to give victims and survivors permission to recall additional details over time. And we have found that that has been extremely helpful. Again, that when the brain begins to recover from trauma, um, oftentimes additional details are recovered over time. So the trauma-informed approaches in the interview, in, in the uh, trauma-informed interview that we look at are, again, moving this from tell us what happened to really focusing on what are you able to tell us about your entire experience, that we want, the, we want to be able to provide the opportunity for the victim to be able to provide a narrative of their account. 
And then uh, and once that narrative is completed without interruption, using the five senses to help retrieve those traumatic memories. Because again, the science tells us that traumatic memory is stored in the brain differently. And if we use the five senses, what did you hear? What did you smell? What did you taste? Um, using all of the senses that we can sometimes uh, help the victim retrieve that traumatic memory that's stored in the brain differently. The goal is to capture the victim's entire experience and the sensory and peripheral details and then consider that as, as potentially compelling evidence that can be considered as part of, uh, as part of any uh, trauma-informed case. Kim talked about the trauma-informed training project uh, uh, topics that we include in, um, in the National Center um, course. And um, all of these are critical in what we're trying to accomplish in a trauma-informed approach for anyone, again, responding to uh, victims and survivors of sexual assault uh, so that we are trauma-informed. One of the things that um, I hear in my travels around the country is uh, we, we see this and hear this all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's this competition between Title IX and the criminal justice system. Let's be clear, the criminal justice system hasn't always responded effectively to these crimes. And so oftentimes what I hear is, well, Title IX has a better response to this. There's greater confidentiality. The criminal justice system takes a long time. And we hear this narrative that, that like there's a competition between these two responses. We have to really get rid of that and think about this as a, uh, as a trauma-informed uh, response to this, a community-coordinated response, that what we know works is that when, when higher ed and the administrative inquiry and the criminal justice system work together in a coordinated way, where we are encouraging uh, victims and survivors to report to both, empowering victims, but also encouraging them to report to both systems. When both systems work together, there's a, there's a greater likelihood for justice. In fact, we've seen examples of this um, in places like Southern Oregon University and Ashland, Oregon Police, with their You Have Options program, where both the administrative inquiry and the police work together with campus police and really encourage the reporting, the victims to report to both systems. And they're showing great results in this with increased reporting rates. We also saw the national headlines regarding the Vanderbilt University and the Nashville, Tennessee Police Joint Investigation. This investigation uh, really uncovered uh, crucial evidence um, that perhaps the Title IX investigation wouldn't have been able to uncover. They used the power of the criminal justice system um, to use uh, subpoena power and search warrants to find crucial evidence as part of that. And a joint investigation by both the university and the Nashville, Tennessee Police Department has led to um, accountability in that particular case and justice for the victims. We also know that from the work that's being done at the University of Montana and the Missoula, Montana Police, they were under a two-year um, agreement with the Department of Justice following a gender discrimination investigation regarding failed response to sexual assault. Over the last two years, both the university and the Missoula, Montana Police have worked to achieve the, and fulfill the, the agreement with the Department of Justice. They've created consistent policy between the university and the police. They conduct joint training together, and they, they have developed a community-coordinated uh, sexual assault safety and accountability audit to really look for gaps in the way their entire community responds to sexual assault, whether it be the criminal justice system or the, or the administrative inquiry as part of the responsibility of the institution. They're also doing external review of police sexual assault investigations, bringing in advocates from the community to look at all felony sexual assault investigations to make sure and, and provide uh, guidance and advice to investigators about how to be trauma-informed and victim-centered in their approach. The victim surveys that we're getting from the University of Montana and the Missoula, Montana Police Department in just two years have completely changed from the original complaints that victims and survivors um, shared with the Justice Department uh, approximately three years ago. Uh, so a lot of work has been done there, and we know what works. We know what works. Working together for justice is, is really the goal. One of the White House Task Force recommendations is to create a model memorandum of understanding between law enforcement, the criminal justice system, and higher education, the administrative responsibilities of Title IX. And that can be found at the, at the White House uh, Task Force 
uh, website. Um, I've included that in this slide. Also, um, when we look at trauma-informed reflections and thinking about this, uh, I think what we have to think about is who will be the first impression of your institution uh, when a victim discloses? And do they know what to say? Do they know what not to say? Have they received trauma-informed training? Do they understand trauma, the science behind it and its impact? Do they understand Title IX investigators and, and the adjudication process? Do campus police and local police understand this? Does everyone know their individual responsibilities and the institutional responsibilities? So uh, again, being trauma-informed really, really um, has us looking at making sure that that first impression is going to be a positive one. Because as we understand, these cases are high stakes for all involved. Whether you're the victim, the complainant, um, the suspect, or the respondent, trauma-informed approach uh, really promotes a fair and balanced approach that lets the facts determine if there's a violation of the student code of conduct or a violation of the law. And trauma-informed reflections are really beginning to show some positive uh, results. Um, I've included a, a link to my website, which actually has a 22-minute um, roll call video that's oftentimes used by law enforcement, but it's very helpful for anyone who is looking at um, understanding the science behind this. It was produced by the Michigan Domestic and Sexual Violence Prevention and Treatment Board, and it can be found at this website location. And that, uh, that fulfills my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, questions are coming in. Um, someone asks, in, says, investigators and others who receive disclosures have concerns about staying neutral and compassionate. How can they balance that with the need to be fair to the accused? Well, any part of a, whether it be a criminal justice investigation or Title IX investigation, requires us to, to be neutral. That being said, what we've learned about both the failure of the criminal justice system to respond effectively to this and other systems is that victims walk away from the process um, either um, not, um, not engaging in the process um, or they, they walk away because they don't feel like they're believed and supported. This is the most underreported crime in our society. So given that, uh, we have to change the way that we respond to this. Uh, making sure that we're trauma-informed in our approach, not second-guessing victim conduct or counterintuitive behaviors, but just recognizing that that's a possibility of trauma. Um, by having a trauma-informed approach, uh, the goal is that victims feel supported in the initial process, they're more likely to engage in the investigation, and then we let the facts determine the truth. Um, is a trauma-informed interview more effective with one, a single interviewer, and does the gender of the interviewer matter? Um, I, I've never felt like the gender of the interviewer mattered. Um, certainly if a victim uh, prefers the, um, the gender of the interviewer, then that's something that should be taken into consideration. We should empower victims to make those kinds of decisions. But to me, it's about the level of training um, the, the interviewer's uh, experience and, and knowledge about these interviews. Um, these are difficult um, things to talk about for everyone, including the interviewer. So having a, an interview that is well-trained, uh, from my perspective, is more important than, than the gender. But certainly we want to empower victims to, to make that choice. And as far as whether it's one interviewer or two, um, I, again, I think that if the interviewers are working in teams, uh, if they have worked together, trained together, um, and the message is clear to the victim, to the survivor, um, that this isn't the first time working together, that they're, they, they're, they're speaking the same message, the, the victims, the survivors are receiving the same message about a trauma-informed approach and support, then um, that certainly team interviewing can be helpful with one person being the lead and the second person simply helping to keep track of the information and taking notes. I'm going to squeeze in one more question during this break, and we may have time later to come back to you, Tom. Um, given that reactions, et cetera, often don't make sense, how does an investigator evaluate credibility that is sensitive and trauma-informed? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do is, is that when we see counterintuitive behavior, when we see something that doesn't make sense to us, that we not judge that, but that we, we look at the science behind trauma. 
Um, so we, we hear victims all the time um, you know, doing and saying things that just don't make sense to us. And the minute we begin to ask, why did the victim do this? Why didn't the victim do that? We're heading down the wrong road. We simply want to recognize that that could be an impact of trauma. We want to look for uh, and document um, any evidence of trauma that the victim um, discloses during their narrative. And then, uh, again, try to document that and look at that in the totality of everything and, and look at all of the evidence to help determine the truth. Tom, thanks very much. And as I say, we'll uh, get back to you uh, with, the, with some other questions that have come up if we have time. Um, but for now, we're going to turn the floor over to Dr. Marisa Randazzo, who's going to talk to us about behavioral threat assessment. Marisa? Steve, thanks very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is another area where colleges and universities are um, expected to take some care in terms of safety for students and for employees alike. I'm going to be talking about behavioral threat assessment, and it's known by several different terms. So you may hear the term threat management. You may hear behavioral threat assessment. You may hear threat assessment. All of these are synonyms for the same process. The threat assessment process is actually a, a four-part process, and it is a, a systematic fact-finding process that's designed to do a couple of things. One is to identify people in situations that raise some concern about potential for campus risk or um, potential violence to people on campus. When uh, situations come to the attention of a threat assessment team or to another team on campus that is trained in threat assessment, they will then gather information from multiple sources to get a full picture of what's going on with the person whose behavior is raising concern. After they gather that information, they go through a fairly systematic process to analyze the information they have at hand and to assess whether or not the person in question poses a threat, meaning is that person thinking about and planning to engage in, in violence on campus to a particular person, uh, on campus generally, to themselves, um, and to see if there is a, a threat posed. And then for those cases where they feel there is a threat posed, that this person is on a pathway to violence, then the team is responsible for taking steps to manage the situation, to manage the person of concern, and to reduce violence. Threat assessment as a process has actually been around for several decades. And it was originally developed by federal law enforcement, including the US Secret Service, to evaluate and mitigate threats posed to particular individuals, like the president and the first family. And over the past several decades, it's been adapted for different environments. So threat assessment was initially adapted by the US Postal Service for use in a workplace setting following a series of post office shootings in the, in the 1980s. It was adapted in the early 2000s for K-12 environments following the Columbine shooting at Columbine High School. And most recently, it's been adapted for higher education settings following the shootings at Virginia Tech University and Northern Illinois University. Now, there really has become a, a consensus that's been developed since those shootings at Northern Illinois University and Virginia Tech University around what colleges and universities should be doing to address threatening behavior on campus, whether that threatening behavior comes from a student or a former student, an employee, or a former employee. We've seen cases where threatening behavior comes from applicants, may come from parents of students, and also where threatening behavior may come from outside the university entirely. We do a lot of work around the country with different colleges and universities to help their threat assessment teams manage particularly complex cases. And oftentimes, we'll see universities where they get a threat from outside the university from someone unaffiliated with the university, not a student, not an employee, not a relative of a student or employee, for example, or even of a, a vendor or a contractor, but someone who may be targeting the university because of a comment that a professor made in an op-ed piece or may, may have made on television commentary, for example, or because a particular speaker has been invited to a certain campus to deliver a commencement address. Threat assessment can be used to identify and gather information about and evaluate and mitigate risk from any of those sources that may be directed to campus. 
So following the Virginia Tech shooting and the Northern Illinois shooting, there was a series of task forces um, and after action reports that were done to try to get a handle on how we can do a better job at preventing campus violence. And the consensus really developed that colleges and universities should have some threat assessment capacity in place and recognizing that there are some specific components of that. So right now we're at a place where there really are some current best practices for what colleges and universities should be doing to address and mitigate threatening behavior on campus. First and foremost, it's having a multidisciplinary team. Now, sometimes these are referred to as threat assessment teams. Sometimes you may hear other terminology like a care team or a behavioral intervention team, a behavioral assessment team, other analogies or other terms that you may use. The key factor here is whatever the team is called, it should be multidisciplinary so that it should have expertise that comes from administration within the college or university that comes from campus law enforcement or campus security that may have a tie to local law enforcement as well, as well and that also has some expertise that comes from the mental health community. So if there is a counseling center on campus, oftentimes someone from the counseling center will sit on the team or they may use a local mental health professional to be able to sit on the team. If there's an employee assistance program, sometimes individuals from that function may sit on a threat assessment team. In addition, there's often other areas that are represented. So a college or university's general counsel's office is often sitting on a team or available to the team to provide some legal guidance in, question, in situations where there may be some legal question at hand. Sometimes there are other components that are brought in, uh, an academic resource center or dis uh, disability services capacity within a college or university may be asked to sit in on a team's discussion of a particular case involving a student who may have a, a recognized or documented disability or may qualify for some assistance from a disability services office. Um, and sometimes that there are people outside in the community that may be able to provide assistance as well that may be helpful for a team to have contact with, such as a, a PTSD center or Veterans Affairs support network within a certain community may be of assistance to a threat assessment team, and a threat assessment team may ask for their involvement and assistance in a particular case. So first and foremost, current best practices says that we should have a multidisciplinary team to address threatening behavior on campus. Second, it's important for the team to have some documented authority from the college or university that they are authorized by the institution to engage in threat assessment on behalf of the institution, to identify situations that raise concern, to gather information from multiple sources, to analyze and assess that information, and then to take reasonable steps to reduce risk based on their assessment if necessary. Sometimes this is as simple as an email that comes from the college or university president to the individuals who have been asked to serve on the team, indicating that they're being asked to serve and that they are empowered to engage in threat assessment on behalf of the institution. Sometimes it's documented in a formal policy that the college or university may choose to adopt. In addition to a multidisciplinary team and authority to engage in threat assessment, it's very important that the team has some standard threat assessment processes and procedures to key on. In other words, there should be some steps that they follow in every case that they can go back and, and demonstrate if questioned about steps that they said should be taken or actions that they recommended. So to have some key procedures and processes and a, a flow chart and a way to follow. In addition to that, it's important to have some additional resources and activities that can really help a threat assessment capacity work well. So these include things such as support from the administration. You know, the, the feeling from the highest levels of the university is that a threat assessment component is an important resource the university has. In addition, having training on what best practice procedures are for threat assessment. There are a lot of teams that are set up around the country that are set up well but don't have any training in how to actually handle a threat case. Legal counsel input, as I said, either on the team or available to the team. In addition, having some ability, at least on an annual basis, to go through some tabletop exercises and to practice these best practice threat assessment procedures so that the team is fairly quick in being able to respond when an actual case does come up. 
Other additional components that help support a threat assessment enterprise include some way to document cases and even a simple searchable database about to be, for a team to be able to look at, is this someone that we have taken a look at before? If so, what worked previously to help address the threatening behavior? What can we do now? Having multiple ways for people throughout the college and university and even in the surrounding community to be able to report concerns about people's behavior to the threat assessment team. And similar to that, having strategies to promote awareness throughout the college or university that we have this violence prevention resource and it's there for your use and for your safety. And as I mentioned before, having some tie-ins with aspects and resources in the community, such as uh, veteran support services, social services within the community, mental health professionals in the community who might be available on a pro bono or a reduced fee basis, and other support resources that may be of assistance to help a threat assessment team do their job very well. Now, I started to mention that threat assessment has really become best practice for colleges and universities to prevent violence on campus. And it's been recognized by a whole host of after action reports and task forces that have been set up since the shootings at Virginia Tech University and Northern Illinois University. I've listed some of these here. Um, including the, the governor, Virginia Governor's After Action Review Panel that looked at the Virginia Tech shooting and came up with recommendations. But all of the departments and agencies and state task forces listed here have recommended that colleges and universities develop and sustain a threat assessment capacity, be that a threat assessment team or some pre-existing team that is now trained in threat assessment procedures to handle threatening behavior and potentially violent behavior. I'll call your attention to the last bullet and that the last two bullets, and that is that there's also now an American national standard. This is a, a practice that's been approved by the American National Standards Institute. And this national standard addresses a whole host of hazard planning for colleges and universities, but it has some very specific language in the national standard that says every college and university within the United States should have some threat assessment team or some threat assessment program or capacity that it can access. Now, national standards don't have the force of law, but they're often called into play in litigation so that if a college or university has a violent event, it may be used as a benchmark against which that college or university's actions would be judged by a jury, for example, to see if they had taken reasonable steps and prudent measures to address threatening behavior before the violence actually occurred. And then in three states within the U.S., threat assessment is now required for colleges and universities. So in Virginia, all public colleges and universities are required to have a threat assessment team. Illinois, for every college and university, public and private, they require a threat assessment team. And most recently within Connecticut, Connecticut passed legislation requiring threat assessment teams and training for their public colleges and universities. One interesting note is that Virginia this past year adopted similar legislation for their K-12 public schools. So now every public K-12 school throughout Virginia, as well as all of their public colleges and universities, universities are required to have threat assessment teams to prevent violence on campus. I've got a list here for further reading for those of you who are interested in reading up more on what best practices are in campus threat assessment. Um, and there are two sites I want to refer you to, two resources. The bottom two, um, sorry, the middle two bullets, the Handbook for Campus Threat Assessment and Management Teams and Implementing Behavioral Threat Assessment on Campus are the two books that are cited in that American National Standard on Hazard Planning for Colleges and Universities. And the National Standard cites those as guidance, as resources that can provide guidance for how best to set up and operate threat assessment teams for a college or university within the U.S. And the last item is an article that my colleagues and I published in the Ermia Journal back in 2011 that sets out the legal landscape and legal expectations for what colleges and universities should be doing in the area of behavioral threat assessment. That Lisa, wraps up the con Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, go, go, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that wraps up my content area. I'd be happy to take questions. Tremendous. Thanks, Marisa. For those of you who do want to follow up on the further reading or anything else in these slides, note in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, there's a way to download the speaker slides. And there will also be a link to the speaker slides on the NCCPS webinars webpage. Um, Marisa, Dwayne Hunter says, I went from one environment where we created BIT, et cetera, from the ground up with open communication and interdepartmental cooperation on my current 
to my current employer where it seems a challenge for public safety, residence life, SDS, and their version of BID. Any suggestions or advice on how to bridge this communication gap would be deeply appreciated. Yeah, that's, it's an excellent question, and it's a situation we see colleges and unis, universities face often, where individual departments often prefer to resort to how they normally handle those situations, and you end up with, with silos and, and information segregated from one department uh, from another, and individual steps taken. One thing we've seen colleges and universities do well is, is have, have a formal team and have someone at a fairly high level of the university call for cooperation among those departments. The, um, the the resource I pointed to on the last bullet under the further reading slide actually can be a great resource that you can pass around to your general counsel, to the college president, to um, your COO, to say, look, there really is a legal case here for us doing this together and not separately. So sometimes that can be helpful to, to have that kind of mandate from the top down. If you already have a team but they're just not sharing well, something that can be helpful is it's really sort of making the effort to offer to share information first. So if you happen to serve in one of those silos, public safety, for example, or student affairs, that you can be the one often going to other departments to say, this is what I know in case it's useful to you. Because if we're always in the position of asking for information, people can get territorial and not want to give it. If we come from a different stance of, let me share with you what I have in case it helps what you're doing, sometimes people end up reciprocating or, or that can be a first step to building trust among those departments that are used to working separately. Another listener asks, do you have a recommendation regarding written records for threat assessment meeting notes? Excellent question, and also there's been no, there's no clear answer to that question. It's a question we get often. What I would tell you is, first and foremost, check with your university or college's general counsel. It is really up to them to make a decision about whether notes are kept from meetings or, or how cases are documented, because it will be your institution's general counsel's responsibility to defend the team's documentation or lack of documentation. So depending on the state where your institution is, there actually may be some laws that come into play that are very specific that may make documentation and note taking easier or more difficult, and in terms of also storage of where you keep those. One thing I will say is that there are many colleges and universities around the country that choose to house their threat assessment team notes and case documentation within their campus law enforcement unit, campus police or campus security, because those are often considered separate from a student's FERPA records. Now, there are some logistics that you have to go through to, to make sure they are created and maintained separately as law enforcement unit records or as investigative records, not as a student's FERPA records. But again, your general counsel should be able to provide some guidance on that. Thanks, Marisa. We've got a couple of other questions, but we'll hang on to them until later. And for now, we are going to move on to Stephen J. Healy, who's going to tell us about fair and impartial policing. Stephen? Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, it's, uh, it's been an honor thus far just to listen to those unbelievable presenters, so I, I really appreciate the um, opportunity to try to contribute something to the conversation. Um, I think when we were brainstorming um, what topics we wanted to cover, and I think it was a consensus agreement that um, obviously institutional response to sexual assault um, had to be on that list, that threat assessment had to be on this list. Uh, and then we kind of um, just played around with what else we were going to talk about, um, what else we thought was important for um, campus uh, administrators to hear about. And, and this idea of fair and impartial policing kind of rose to, to the top given all the things that are happening around the country um, and that may potentially happen on your campus as well. And so um, we're going to try to provide some recommendations on ways that you can um, proactively um, address these issues. So th th this is the agenda. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about context, um, talk about this role um, as community educators. We often in, in campus public safety have this um, long-standing uh, debate about what we really are. Are uh, we first and foremost um, law enforcement officers? Are we campus public safety officers? Are we community educators? So I just want to raise that a bit. And then uh, some concrete recommendations on what you can be doing um, uh, right now. So I, I, I'm going to start with the bad news. Um, I think that we should expect um, over the next several years to remain in, in what is um, definitely a turbulent time 
with regards to relationships between um, some communities and law enforcement, um, specifically um, communities of color, but it's, it's not limited to, to those communities. I, I think that given what we've seen um, uh, with officer-involved shootings and, and use of force, I think that we can expect that communities, given the, the proliferation of social media, um, given um, you know the the, the twenty four hour news cycle, we can expect that there will continue to be um, unrest and um, and demonstrations and protests in response to police use of force. And that's not a comment about whether the force is is, is authorized and, and legally justifiable. It's just a reality of of, of the time. Um, you know, just as Tom mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the, the activism and the outrage around sexual assault and institutional response to sexual assault is, is kind of a ground roots um, led movement. And I think, um, you know, we haven't seen this level of outrage with regard to the tenor of relationships with the community and, and law enforcement since the 1960s. Um, and so I think you would be um, very smart to think about how you're going to respond um, if there are demonstrations in your local communities that are adjacent to your campus that affect your campus, if there are demonstrations actually on your campus. As you know, um, um, from the the Black Lives Matter um, movement, there were there were protests and demonstrations on campuses all across the country, and I can expect that, and, and I, I would expect that those will continue. Uh, and then um, the the real reality is, what if you have a situation on your own campus? Have you thought about how you will respond and how you will manage? Um, you know, manage that situation in the immediate aftermath. If you have a use of force um, incident on your campus involving one of your one of your officers, um, and I would just uh, just turn you to the uh, an incident that happened at Yale University um, and Chief Higgins and the response that the institution undertook in response to their use of force incident, um, and and I think that they managed that um, as well as one could possibly manage it in terms of communicating with the campus and the wider community. So, so the good news around this is that um, I believe, based on my experience, that we have a very strong legacy of, um, of, of unbelievable engagement with the campus community, and um, we have for long embraced the concept of, of co the concepts of community policing. So, I think we are in a good position. Um, and if you look at the, the testimony that that uh, Chief Perry, who was the IACLEAR president, um, offered to the, to the to the president's task force on 21st century policing, uh, I, I think you'll see that he echoes that those that sentiment that we we have been engaged in community policing for a very very long time. We have close relationships with the campus community and and really understand the importance of them. And we um, uh, tend to engage in in pretty intensive training around use of force given the environment the environments that we work in. So that that's the good news. And I think those three points really serve as a very strong foundation and a launching point for us to do more around um, uh, objective assessment of our own policies and practices. So um, I, I just want to raise this issue. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I do think that there is a need for some introspection and time for us to be um, somewhat reflective practitioners when we think about what we are as um, from a law enforcement, from a campus public safety or campus law enforcement perspective, right? So what is our primary goal? Are we first and foremost law enforcers? Are we first and foremost community educators? Um, and this is a struggle that many, well, it's not a struggle. It's, it's a question that many institutions often, uh, many campus law enforcement agencies often grapple with, given the fact that we are in educational environments. Um, you know, everything at the institution should be geared primarily towards supporting uh, a healthy environment so that the educational process can occur. And we, I think we have to make sure that we understand what we are first and foremost. And one of the ways that I see as a, as a good way to figure that out is to make sure that you're involved into some, some deep soul searching, uh, organizational soul searching to um, make sure that we define our true north. So what are our core values? What matters most to us? 
And then once we have those core values and we understand what our strategic vision and positioning is and who we are as an agency, that those ideas and ideals and values should guide everything we do and really need to be woven into to every single aspect of the department, including policies, procedures, practices, training, and hiring and selection. I think that's one of the areas that we um, obviously um, need to be really, really um, attentive to, making sure that we're hiring people who first and foremost want to serve, second, they can knock and knock down doors if they need to, but first you need to find those people who, who want to serve the community. So um, this is kind of the list of, of the, the things that I think that you can do that you should be thinking about um, in the short term. Um, and so that first bu bullet there is build, build, and build more. And what I'm talking about there is relationships. Um, you can never, you should never rest on your laurels and think that we are where we need to be in terms of engaging with the campus community. Um, and I, I point you to um, the, 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 the real strong need to ensure that we are engaging with traditionally marginalized groups. Um, and you know, there are a number of initiatives across campuses around the country um, who, who have really strong, strong initiatives in this way. Uh, but I, again, there are a number of agencies that should probably pay attention. So if you have groups on campuses, which a lot of campuses do, you know, um, groups that represent um, traditionally marginalized groups, you know, uh, communities of color, um, um, LGBT community, you need to make sure that you are engaging with them in a very meaningful way. And one of the ways to do that is to have a member of your department assigned as a liaison so that you're working with the, so that you're in touch with that, that, um, those groups and understand how they experience your provision of campus public safety services. Um, and I think sometimes you'd be surprised. I mean, we get a chance to, to, to talk to those student organizations across the country. Sometimes we hear really, really good things. Sometimes we hear things that, um, that the agency itself has never heard because they haven't engaged. So you need to build those relationships. And, and that is an ongoing process. It's never, ever done. Um, take the community's temperature. Um, you know, one of the one of the recommendations from the White House Task Force on, on uh, protecting students from sexual assault is to conduct a survey um, or climate, you know, a, a campus climate survey. So students are being um, surveyed um, um, to, to, you know, to, to no end. Um, so what I would say is as much as possible, you want to try, to, if there's a campus-wide survey going on, you want to try to make sure that the campus public safety interests are represented in that survey and find out, to ask a few questions to, to try to get some, um, some empirical data on what that experience is like. Establish early warning systems. Um, you know, this is, this is a practice that has been evolving for a number of years, but what these systems allow you to do, and they can be as sophisticated as an off-the-shelf software application that you're using, um, or it could be you know, a simple tracking through the personnel files, but these systems allow you to identify officers in situations as well that are high liability issues and um, potentially problem, uh, problematic officers. So how are you tracking your use of force? Are officers actually filling out use of uh, force um, uh, report forms um, as they are required? Are you evaluating those use of force reports? Is there, uh, are there officers who are using, um, engaging in force more than others? Um, if you're collecting any demographic data on interactions with the campus community, which I highly recommend you do, um, including um, you know racial profiling and what, whatever demographic in information you can get, uh, you need to be able to, 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 to check that data and be very objective about what it means. Um, you need to look at all your policies, um, especially your high risk ones. And I'm just really, really quick kind of give you a list of what I mean by high risk. So off-duty conduct, obviously use of force or, or response to resistance policies vehicular pursuit uh, and foot pursuits for that matter and, and emergency vehicle operations, search, seizure, and arrest, obviously care, custody, and control of, 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 of prisoners or detainees, um, domestic and dating violence for your own officers, um, sexual harassment and discrimination in all its forms in your own department, selection and hiring, which obviously is, is, is the key. If you get that wrong, um, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to get it right. I'm um, looking at your professional standards and internal affairs, any special operations that your department may be involved in, 
and then obviously dealing with um, dealing with individuals who may have um, a, a mental illness. So those 12 items are high risk areas that you need to be paying attention to. Review and enhance your training as much as possible. Uh, uh, making sure that you are uh, focusing on cultural competency, um, uh, and, and Tom mentioned that as, as, as important for, for your sexual assault investigations as well. Establish an advisory committee. This is a definitely a best practice. Um, you need to have this advisory committee so that you um, can keep your finger on the pulse of the campus community. Evaluate technology and leverage it where necessary. You know, body-worn cameras were a novel idea two years ago. I, I predict that in the next, you know, next two to three years, they will become a standard part of the equipment. You need to be evaluating that, deciding and developing your policies. And then, obviously, you need to stay tuned to the national dialogue and your local dialogue as well to see how um, incidents may um, impact your own campus. But if you do these things, I think you'll have a good, you'll be in a good position to say, we feel good or we don't feel good about our practices, um, and these are the things that we're tweaking. So if you have a situation or um, you know, your campus community gets involved and wants to know what you're doing, you can say these are the things that we've undertaken over the past, you know, over the past several months to, to ensure that we are providing the best possible service in a fair and impartial way. These are some resources um, that you um, can can obviously use. Um, a lot of a lot of things that support the 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 the, the ideas that I just presented, and, and some templates and some other things that you could pay attention to. And that concludes my formal remarks. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, we're going to pick up some questions for you, and then some questions that have come in for our other speakers. And for those questions that we don't get to, we will make some arrangements for follow-up. So Stephen, um, someone says, we participate in use of force training as campus security that carries only tasers. When can all campus security have the right to carry guns? Most threats that come onto campus only see others as threats and take them out. How do most of us campus security that are not armed protect ourselves? We have great community policing with our students, but not the outside community because our university is surrounded by a high crime area. That's a, that's a great question. And frankly, that's the question that has been on the table for several years now at a number of institutions that are making the decision about how they will uh, resource their campus public safety officers. So the, the fundamental question is, what does your campus community expect when they pick up the phone and call campus safety? Um, if they are uh, uh, basically expecting a, uh, an, an observe and report function or um, a response, then you know I, I think you have to think about um, what that level, what levels of force those people have, are statutorily authorized. Um, generally, it's only less lethal um, force options. Then the other question is, if you decide, or if you, through your conversations and discussions, reach a point where you say, we expect our officers to respond and neutralize the situation as much as possible, then the question becomes, what do I need to, how do I need to equip these individuals to neutralize the situation? And I think it's really, it's a conversation that has to happen at all campuses, and I think it's something that uh, campuses should be having on a routine basis. Stephen, can you expand on who should be on an advisory committee? Sure. So um, another great question. Um, the advisory committees take many different forms. Um, I've seen institutions that have an advisory, uh, advisory committee for uh, employees only, and then they have a separate one for, for students. And so let me just talk about the student one. Um, I think, uh, again, you should have representation from the groups um, or, or yeah the groups or organizations that tra uh, that represent tr traditionally under mar under mar uh, marginalized groups underrepresented groups so again um, uh, uh, students of color you know the la la, you know Latino Latina groups uh, maybe your Asian student groups your um, a a uh, African American groups the LGBT co community if you have a, um, a student organization that focuses on Greek life um, or someone from that community. Um, and other groups that, um, that, that, again, are traditionally underrepresented or may have traditionally had strained relationships with law enforcement. So you want to include those, but you also want to include um, students at large. Um, so I think for in, in terms of a student-based group, that's a good start. Uh, on the other side, faculty, staff, um, and other, any other areas of, uh, of the campus from, uh, from employees, um, individuals, you know, someone from the Senate, someone from, you know, from the Faculty Senate, someone from the Staff Senate, um, so that you are, have a good cross-representation and can get input.
from all of the, the different segments of the community. You know, the, the theme here um, through all of our presentations is multidisciplinary and, and collaborative. So you want to create those situations that uh, you're, you're talking to multidisciplinary groups and you're getting um, diverse input from the, the individuals who are sitting on the committee. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Tom Trombley, I'm going to go back and pick up a question that came in after your presentation. Um, how does the impact of the trauma change over time? Would the impact be different for someone reporting an incident hours later, days later, weeks later, or months later? I think the best way to answer that is to recognize that there is no normal response. There is, you really can't, everybody responds differently. As I indicated, the um, we don't control how the brain and body responds to trauma, so there can be a wide range of, uh, of issues that you will see. Um, some of those might be evident uh, immediately following a traumatic event, uh, and oftentimes you see uh, the impacts of trauma uh, can be lifelong. So again, really being trauma-informed, recognizing the impacts of trauma, and then using trauma-informed approaches in our interview with victims should be helpful at any time the victim is experiencing trauma. Thanks. Uh, and Marisa Rendazzo, um, a question about threat assessment. Will these assessments also work in the high school setting? Uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, they were first modified for a K-12 setting a number of years ago. Uh, the Secret Service and the U.S. Department of Education have a great guide that's available at uh, secretservice.gov, um, or you can just Google uh, threat assessment in schools. Uh, it's called Threat Assessment in Schools, a guide to uh, handling threat threatening situations and creating safe school climates. So uh, it walks you through all the steps for a high school or even a middle or elementary school environment. Uh, and Tom, back to you. Um, during your presentation, you made a comment about victims changing their stories. And someone wondered at that time, what leads to victims changing their stories? I, I don't recall specifically saying that victims change their story. Certainly what, what ends up happening oftentimes is that victims will recall additional detail over time. So uh, what the science of trauma informs us is that um, the, the memory is fragmented and um, victims struggle to provide sequence of events. And so when we, when we interview and ask them for sequence of events, um, they're struggling to come up with that. Uh, the memory is fragmented. So what will happen oftentimes is that victims will recall additional detail following the interview. It may be minutes or hours or even days or weeks later where they will recall additional detail. What we have to do is recognize that that's a normal part of trauma, that the brain is recovering from the traumatic event and its additional details um, sometimes come uh, come out over time, and we have to accept that and give the victim permission to um, really really come up with an agreement with the victim that if they remember additional detail over time, write it down and contact us, and then we can consider that um, additional detail as part of the whole evidence of the case. And also for you, Tom, what are the pros and cons to recording uh, interviews? So certainly you see this more in the criminal justice arena. You see uh, police um, either a video or audio record. Um, I don't see it as much in the training that I do around the country with Title IX investigators, although a couple of institutions are doing that. I, I prefer um, recording, um, but every institution needs to make their, their own choice on that and have a conversation with legal counsel about what that means. What it means is that the interviewer has to be comfortable with the interview process. Um, and, it, and, and what it does from my perspective is it allows the interviewer to focus on the, the victim and the victim's statement uh, as opposed to uh, stopping and writing notes. Um, and uh, again, it just the interview is more interactive when you're not having to stop and write notes. And, and then you, in the end, you have a, a recording of the, of the statement that you can use as part of your evaluation of the facts of the case. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks very much to all four of our speakers today, Kim Richmond, Tom, Thomas R. Trimbley, Dr. Marisa Randazzo, and Stephen J. Healy. 
And thanks to all, thanks also to all of our viewers and questioners from around the internet. Check the NCCPS webinars webpage for a link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as a link to our speaker slides and individual white papers on today's topics. And watch your email for that brief evaluation survey on today's session. We read and act on your comments. In addition to today's webinar, the National Center for Campus Public Safety offers a wide range of other events and resources. You'll find details on the web at nccpssafety.org. Again, that's nccpssafety.org. Campus Public Safety Online is brought to you by the National Center for Campus Public Safety with support from the University of Vermont Continuing Distance Education and the U.S. Department of Justice. Special thanks today to Andrea Young and Dan Cardella. This is Steve Warona. Thanks for being with us for Campus Public Safety Online.